Crimes and Misdemeanors, the 1989 film directed by Woody Allen, is a somewhat cynical examination of a group of intersecting individuals living and working in New York City. The film follows Judah Rosenthal, an ophthalmologist who is torn between his wife and a vexatious mistress, and Cliff Stern, a documentary filmmaker trapped in a loveless marriage. The film functions to pervert and contradict the messages within the novel Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. As in Dostoevsky's novel, the crime committed by the central characters is one of ideological intoxication, wherein they entrust their own destinies and tenets of morality to the judgment of a higher, supposedly wiser power. The most obvious manifestation of this external power in Crimes and Misdemeanors is of course the figure of God, which is evoked from the onset of the film as the ophthalmologist Judah Rosenthal recounts his father's message to him that the eyes of God are on us always. Ironically, we then discover that Judah himself has not been living up to this ideal, but has been cheating on his wife with another woman. However, his mistress, Dolores Paley, has become infatuated with Judah and insists that he leave his wife to be with her, even threatening to expose their affair if he does not. Worried about his reputation and hesitant to throw his life into disarray, Judah is eventually talked into having Dolores assassinated. With this most sinful of deeds, Judah's childhood beliefs in an all-knowing and vengeful god re-emerge, and he becomes consumed by guilt and fear of damnation. Meanwhile, we are introduced to Woody Allen's character, a struggling documentary filmmaker named Cliff Stern, who, like Judah, is trapped in a loveless and passionless marriage. Cliff's moral quandary is twofold. On one hand, he is leveraged into filming a flattering fluff piece for his brother-in-law Lester, a successful and egocentric television producer, and on the other he becomes infatuated with the film's associate producer, Hallie Reed. While Judah's ideological belief emerges in the form of a rekindled fear of an all-powerful god, Cliff's is found in his belief that the documentary format can reveal objective truth and bring about personal redemption. As he reluctantly goes about his work on Lester's commercial film, he secretly tries to push his own passion project and his affections onto Halle Reed, believing that the fundamentally more profound and interesting nature of his film's subject, as well as his own virtues as a romantic partner, will be rewarded. In both these circumstances, the holders of these beliefs are proven to be utterly mistaken. Judah's fear and remorse under the assumed gaze of an omniscient god nearly drive him to confess, but it is his ultimate silence that proves his salvation. By simply weathering the turbulent storm in his own conscience, he emerges into clear skies, free to continue his life of affluence and wealth unencumbered. Cliff, on the other hand, allows his faith in the veracity of cinematic storytelling to manifest by repurposing the film about Lester to be a smear piece, exposing him as the pig-headed, autocratic bully that he sees him to be. And thus he seems genuinely surprised when Lester fires him from the project. To add insult to injury, the subject of his passion project, Dr. Levy, dies, leaving the film devoid of purpose, and he without an idol to cling to. His defeat on this front is swiftly followed by a crushing loss on the romantic battlefield as well, as Hallie Reed becomes Lester's fiance. Both Judah and Cliff put their faith into a force greater than themselves, one religious and one creative, and both are proven foolhardy, as those whose attachment to the practical and material world prosper at the expense of those who hold irrational belief. The film uses the visual metaphor of eyeglasses or spectacles to segregate the characters who are ideologically intoxicated from those who act more pragmatically. Characters who wear eyeglasses are consistently those who put their faith in a higher power or an idea beyond themselves, with the hopes that it will impose some form of order onto their world and that ultimately their faith will be rewarded. This includes Cliff Stern throughout the film, including at the very end, indicating his ultimate destiny to remain dedicated to his beliefs and faithfully serve at the altar of cinema to his personal detriment. Meanwhile, Hallie, the woman he's been pining for, is seen without glasses at the film's conclusion. She, now like her fiance Lester, living in pursuit of individual happiness and fulfillment, rather than adherence to a lofty ideal. Likewise, we also see glasses worn by Judah at certain instances throughout the film, particularly in the scenes in which he is confronting his own notions of morality and attempting to rationalize his sinful actions given the re-emergence of his faith. However, at the end of the film, his glasses are absent, indicating his relinquishment of the moral standards of the Abrahamic God, 
and his acceptance of the ultimate subjectivity of right and wrong. While, on the other hand, his pastor, who provided him with religious guidance and righteous teachings, is left blind by the film's conclusion. The spiritual and ideological journeys undertaken by both Cliff and Judah not only shape their own destinies, or lack thereof, but also speak to both the past and the future of their respective beliefs. Judah's return to his childhood home in a time of crisis conjures a memory of his father espousing the teachings of God at the dinner table, while his Aunt May rebuts them with her more secular and atheistic viewpoints. This argument echoes the dilemma taking place in Judah's own mind, and May's arguments seem to not only foreshadow his ultimate decision to not allow himself to be punished, but also alludes to the growing skepticism and moral permissiveness found in a changing cultural and historical context, a collective loss of faith which, according to May's outlook, began with the tragedy of the Holocaust. Cliff's space of mediation and moral contemplation seems to be the cinema, where he frequently attends films with both Hallie and his younger niece, as he attempts to impart his own Hollywood-informed ideals onto his would-be partner and the impressionable youth. Yet these same values are proven naive, as Hallie leaves him for a more successful and charismatic man, who despite being presented through the filmic lens of Cliff's film, and even of the actual film, as a villain, is nonetheless touted as apparently being a good man. Thus the film suggests to us that the cinematic gaze may be no more reliable a moralizer than the teachings of a supposedly all-powerful being who still allows unspeakable evils to take place. As for Cliff's niece, we find her mother and guardian, desperate to find the love of her life, having encountered a stranger at a club who has tied her down and defecated upon her, her Hollywood-inspired ideals of romance literally shat upon by the unsavory realities of the modern dating world. In this way, Alan's crimes and misdemeanors subverts the expectations of the novel upon which it is loosely based by retaining the titular aspect of crime, with characters sinning and transgressing in all manner of salacious ways, but in displacing the punishment that they all deserve but never receive. Instead, the wicked are rewarded, the guilty left to languish, and the believer blinded, left to wander a treacherous moral landscape, absent any guiding light.